It was a sunny and relatively warm day. A good day to get out and go for a walk. As I looked around the parking lot, the moon hung over the treetops, just about ready to retire for the day. Looking towards the east, the sun was dazzling, reflecting off the layer of ice that coated the parking lot. We were going to walk on the Hayburger Trail, so named for the homesteading family that once lived in the area. It's an 11 kilometer loop that leads through some gentle hills and a variety of forest and marshy areas. With all the soft snow, it was likely to take longer than the estimated three to four hours. Hayburger is one of those trails that sometimes can't be accessed as bull bison are sometimes seen around the entrance. So sometimes our planned hikes here are thwarted and we end up going on another trail. Animal trails crisscrossed ours and led deeper into the forest. People sometimes get lost on this and other trails in the park, so it's important to keep track of where the main trail is. We reached the marsh where I had spotted the bald eagles last year, during our failed hike when it was too icy to continue further. I'll put a link to that video in the description box below. This day, however, was only a failure in the sense that we didn't see much wildlife. The sunlight cast strong shadows, lighting up the roots that the animals took through the brush. It also lit up the tall trees, contrasting on the blue sky. And I found a feather caught on a branch. It might belong to an owl. And I also spotted something which sparked a memory from my childhood. I used to see these in the snow all the time, around on the trails in Thompson. I used to think that they were uh, tobacco, but they're birch seeds. I was also delighted to find some grouse tracks, a trail of little stars across the white snow. These birds have thick feathers around the base of their feet to help them stay on top of the snow, like snowshoes. snowy as you can see but uh, it's supposed to be quite warm today right now I think it's about minus two and yeah sun is out when we pause you can actually we were hearing some coyotes kind of yipping way off in the distance and then uh, nut hatches Raven, woodpeckers pecking on whatever. <laughs> yeah, very nice. 
trail. I think we've come up maybe about a couple kilometers already. This is about 11 kilometer trail. Not bad, especially if we're in the winter. Um, the trail is still quite snow packed. Not too icy or anything, so my knee isn't giving me trouble yet. Hopefully it stays that way. What I've been enjoying is actually seeing all the uh, the grouse footprints in the snow. They're kind of fun. They like little stars. <laughs> and then all the other footprints as well. Traces of elk and um, bison and those rabbit foot tracks, footprints and um, squirrels as well. Of course, they're everywhere. Very nice day. Our journey continued, and I kept looking into gaps between the trees to see what was there. The animal trails were tantalizing in that I might find the source of the footprints, but the prospect of stepping into the deep snow and ending up with wet ankles kept me from venturing off trail. Still, in some areas, we saw evidence of homes close to the trail. Someone had been digging in the snow here, and later ate seeds on a nearby log. Being a marshy area, we saw some evidence of beavers. Much of the Elk Island Park area is mixed with hills and marsh, which is not the best land for settling on. Even still, a number of German, English, and Ukrainian settlers came to the Beaver Hills area in 1881 and 1882, when the Dominion Lands Act offered cheap land for settlers to occupy and start farming. When the park was founded in 1906, several families still lived on what is now park land. By 1909, most had sold their land to the Dominion government, but some, like the Hayberger family, continued to live in the area until the 1930s. This trail follows their wagon trail. Other families also ended up with lakes or trails named in their memory, including the Oster family, who lived in the area until 1941 and cleared 40 acres to farm. Their farm was plagued by bison and other wildlife who enjoyed eating their crops. Carl H. Oster gave up his land title for the right to remain on his homestead and served as the park's gatekeeper until he retired. Daniel Jordan was a squatter in the park who lost his land rights in 1909, and he was given $900 to relocate from the park. Jordan Lake bears his name. We also found a place where bison tend to rub themselves, as some of the markings were quite recent, and other trees showed wounds that had healed over. This fallen tree had provided a meal for a hungry rabbit as they gnawed off the bark and left numerous tracks in the snow. As we rounded the trail loop, the changing angle of the sun was almost making me hot. It was also changing the texture of the snow. Here, it had a bit of an ice layer to it. We also saw evidence of numerous coyotes in the area. For what felt like a few kilometers, we seemed to be following a coyote in heat, as she seemed to be urinating frequently with blood in the urine. I won't show any clips of that, but here it looks like she dove into the snow to try and dig out some prey. Okay, that's 
The trails are generally well marked with blazes and the occasional kilometer marker. However, it always seems backwards to me, as this sign means that there are 8 kilometers left. Either way, I was sure we had walked a lot further, but this 8k squirrel was pretty cute. This is the compilation of some of the various tracks that we saw. These little feet were tiny. This looks like hopping. Probably another mouse. These tracks seemed unusual to me. I would love to think that these might belong to a weasel or something similar. These ones are likely squirrel. Now it's six kilometers back to the parking lot. A fallen tree made for a little bit of trail drama. Lyndon had ventured into the trees for an interesting shot. We had rounded the loop and were finally heading in the direction of the parking lot. These bent trees were interesting. I wonder if heavy snow had caused them to bend over to form a natural arch. This side path is not part of the trail, and it's heavily marked to indicate for hikers to follow the curve around. As I mentioned earlier, there have been instances where people have gotten lost and being tired with a moment of inattention could cause someone to go off course. Even the trail back could be missed, as it's a sharp turn as well. Start comparison to the other trail. The other trail, there was maybe two people who had been on it in the past couple of days. This one is definitely well trodden. During our hike, we only saw three other hikers on this trail and all of them were pretty close to the trailhead. As always, thanks for watching.